Wednesday mornings. We are traveling through Galatians. We just started a few weeks ago. If you're visiting with us, we go through the books of the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we just started Galatians three weeks ago. We've traveled through chapter one. So now we're going to go to chapter two. And you'll find Galatians right after 1st, 2nd Corinthians. And let's pray. Father, we do ask that you'd bless this time in the study of your word. And Lord, um, as we want to get established in the gospel of grace, we want to be able to just know what your word says and to be established in it. And, and Lord, I thank you that we're here. So teach us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to remember to turn ringers off our phones. And Lord, we do want to be ones that are attentive to the things that you have to say. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So Galatians is the first epistle that we have in the New Testament penned by Paul the Apostle. Of course, inspired by the Spirit of God as, as uh, God's Word is put to the page. And as Paul, he, he took pen to parchment, writing to the Galatian believers. He does it early in his ministry. And, and the reason that he's writing to them is we know that there were those who were coming in behind Paul's ministry. He and Barnabas, on that first missionary journey, went and established the churches of Galatia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium. Uh, and we see that in Acts chapter 14. Well, Paul would return to Antioch, and there are those who were coming along, and they were perverting the gospel, the, the legalists, the, the Judaizers, as they were called. Now, the Judaizers were Jewish Christians. They believed in Jesus Christ, but they were bringing a different gospel. And Paul, right away in verse 6, he says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who pervert the gospel of Christ. They trouble you. And these Judaizers were troubling the Gentile believers. Now, the Gentile believers are non-Jewish believers. And they're enjoying their newfound faith in Christ. And all of a sudden, the Judaizers came along and said, listen, it's not that simple. It's not just faith in Jesus Christ, but you have to be circumcised and you have to keep the law of Moses. So Paul is telling them, as we have seen so far, that there's one gospel and that in this chapter, chapter one that we went through, he told them that the gospel that he brought to the Christians of Galatia was not, you know, man's doctrine. Uh, it was not taught to him by man. He did not receive it from man. He didn't make it up, but rather he received it from direct revelation of Jesus Christ. And Paul here begins to give his testimony. He was one that would tell them that I was advanced in Judaism before his conversion. We know that in the book of Acts. Uh, he was one that was dedicated to the law. Matter of fact, in the book of Philippians, later on, he would write to them and he would say to them as those who were coming to the church at Philippi, uh, saying that you need to be circumcised. The Judaizers were still around uh, at that point when Paul's writing in about 60, 61 AD. And Paul says, listen, have no confidence in the flesh. If anyone had confidence in the flesh, it was me more so, because I was a Pharisee of Pharisee. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I was one that was circumcised on the eighth day. And he begins to talk about how he was so zealous for his religion. And Paul, he's given his manifesto, if you would, here, because he's writing how he went from legalism a pursuit of knowing and living after the law and trying to be righteous by the law to a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ and that he's no longer living in his own righteousness through the law. Matter of fact, we're going to see as we continue this, this epistle that Paul makes it very clear that the law will not make you righteous. The law only condemns you. It shows that we come up short, that it is Jesus Christ that he's the one, as we come to faith in him, that he imputes that righteousness to you and to me. And it comes by knowing him and through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And in chapter 1, Paul, the apostle of grace, is defending grace. And the gospel that he brought to the Christians, again, emphasizing the source of that gospel, came by revelation of Jesus Christ in verse 12. 
And Paul here, as he gives his manifesto, speaks about the time that after he got converted, he would go to Damascus. He goes into the synagogue there. They're absolutely confounded. Is this the same Paul that came to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, to arrest Christians, to take them back to Jerusalem, who's caused havoc on the church, Acts chapter 8, and now he's preaching Christ to us in the synagogue? And they didn't come to salvation. They, they were confounded but not converted. He would leave and he would go to Arabia. He would come back to Damascus. He would have to leave, escape for his life because he went back into that synagogue. This time the Jews wanted to kill him. So under the cover of night, Acts chapter 9 records how he was lowered down in a basket over the wall in Damascus. Then he would go up to Jerusalem. That was a period of three years that he was in Arabia, went back to Damascus, goes up to Jerusalem. And when he goes to Jerusalem, uh, we know that the apostles are kind of holding him out at arm's length, saying, we don't know about this guy. He's the one that persecuted the church very heavily. He goes into the synagogue in Jerusalem there, and he's preaching to the Hellenist Jews. Those are the Jews with a Greek background. They want to kill Paul. So the apostles, the leaders there, put him on a boat to go to Tarsus. And Paul would be there in Tarsus learning to make tents, not known by the churches, as he writes in, in chapter 1, until Barnabas came and got him when revival broke out in Antioch, Assyria. So we see here, as we move into chapter 2, he's going to continue very to wrap up this, this testimony that he has. And it's going to focus chapter 2 more on the context of the message that he brought. So let's begin to look at Galatians chapter 2 in verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. As we read last week, uh, Paul going up to Jerusalem, uh, lowered in a basket uh, in Damascus would lead him to Jerusalem. Um, and as he is sent off to Tarsus for that number of times, he would be converted, of course, in Acts chapter 9. Now, in the book of Acts, there's five visits recorded that, that Paul made to the holy city after his conversion. Acts chapter 9, which he just mentioned in chapter 1. Acts chapter 11, in verses 18 through 20, the famine visit. The church in Antioch, Barnabas and Saul, went to Jerusalem to bring relief to them. They were suffering because of famine. He wanted to bring a relief to them. Paul had real sensitivity for the Christians there in Jerusalem. He would also do it later as he speaks to the Corinthians. He says, lay your gifts on the first day of the week, your offerings, so we can come and get it. And he would travel to Jerusalem to give to them at that time because I believe Paul he knew that he had persecuted very heavily the Christians in Jerusalem. He had a special uh, affection for them, and he wanted to minister to them. So that famine visit of Acts chapter 11, early in his ministry, and then Acts chapter 15, where the Jerusalem council comes together, that is the church leaders, the apostles, and the elders. And I want to make reference to that because I think it's an important chapter, Acts chapter 15, for you to be able to show others when somebody comes along, and if this has not happened to you, it probably will happen to you. For most of you, you can say, yeah, somebody's come along and said, you're not saved unless you're baptized. You're not saved unless you keep the Sabbath. You're not saved unless you do this religious act, or you go to this church, or you keep the dietary laws. Well, Acts chapter 15 is a very important resource for you to be able to show people that, you know, what do you mean you have to be baptized? And I'll explain that in just a minute. But there's two other visits that Paul made to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 18, and then again in chapter 21. Chapter 21, Paul goes there. He gets arrested. He goes through a series of trials that leads him, as you read the end of the book of Acts, to Rome. He appealed to Caesar because he was a Roman citizen. And they said, to Caesar you shall go. There he gets on a boat, he's going to Rome, and there he would be under house arrest for two years, and he would write the prison epistles that we have in the New Testament. But this, this, this here going to Jerusalem that is referenced here in verse 1, as he went up with Barnabas, with Titus, it was either the famine visit or the Jerusalem council visit. Now the Jerusalem council visit, again, just bear with me, 
Paul is, is going up to Jerusalem and Barnabas. The church leaders are gathering, and I know I've made reference to Acts chapter 15, but bear with me. They have this whole discussion. They, they need to come up to clarification. They need to come up with, um, you know, uh, do we tell these, these Christians, these Gentile believers, that they have to be circumcised and that they have to keep the law of Moses? Let me read to you Acts chapter 15, just a few verses, but, but just listen here. That certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So there is this great contention, Paul and Barnabas and and the guys from Antioch coming up to Jerusalem. And some of the leaders there in Jerusalem that had a Jewish background, they were saying you have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law of Moses. Matter of fact, in verse 5, I'll read it to you of Acts chapter 15. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So it wasn't just about circumcision, it was also keeping of the Sabbath, it was keeping the law of Moses. And Christianity at this time, the early church, was in danger of just being another sect of Judaism. So Paul and Barnabas, Titus, if this is the Jerusalem council visit, they go up to Jerusalem, the leaders meet there in Acts chapter 15. And it was Peter that would stand up. And Peter would begin to to say, listen, why do we want to put this yoke of legalism? The the sect of the Pharisees coming along and saying that uh, it's necessary to circumcise them. Isn't it interesting that some of the Pharisees got saved after the resurrection of Jesus? Because the Pharisees were the main enemies of Jesus before, you know, his crucifixion. And they were the ones that really contended against Jesus concerning the Sabbath. So the Pharisees, some of them got saved. When you go to the book of Acts, just a little observation, that you'll notice that the Sadducees were the main enemies against the early Christians. And the Pharisees, some of them that weren't converted, yes, they they also played a part in persecuting the Christians. But it's really emphasized the Sadducees. And the reason was is because the Sadducees They were the chief priests. They were the ones that were uh, fewer in number. They were more powerful, uh, had more political clout in the land, uh, generally more wealthy. But we know that the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in much of the Old Testament. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So when they started hearing reports of Jesus' resurrection in Jerusalem... Um, and there was angels seen at the tomb, they, they really would step forward in persecuting the Christians. But some of the Pharisees as well, part of the council that were still in their religiousness and not converted, they would persecute the Christians. But there were some that did get saved. You must keep the law of Moses, they were saying. They were still bound up in their legalism. They were trying to create that another sect of Judaism. And it is Paul that as he's meeting them, Peter, as I said, would stand up. And Peter would say, why do we want to put this this yoke, this yoke of legalism around the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to, to bear? That's quite an amazing statement that Peter is making. You see, Peter, he's the one that initially brought the gospel to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 10, when he went to the home of Cornelius there in Caesarea, Uh, And he would give the gospel to Cornelius and his family. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. And he said uh, that, you know, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter, in this meeting with the the leaders, we shall be saved as in the same manner as they. Peter was saying, why do we want to put this yoke of legalism on these new converts that our fathers couldn't keep? But we will be saved in the same manner as they. In other words, we Jews are so entangled in legalism, we're not free to enjoy our salvation. And as they come to a conclusion here, they're led by the Holy Spirit. Because I've shown this chapter to others that said, oh, they just came up on their own reasoning. No, it says in verse 28, as they write a letter to the Gentile believers, this is what we're going to tell them on this whole matter of circumcision. 
on the whole matter, do they keep the law of Moses? You can show that individual that comes along and says, you're not saved unless you're baptized. I've had plenty of people tell me that, you know, emailing me, calling me, call me on the radio. You have to be circum or have to be baptized to be saved. This is what they said. That it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Number one, that you abstain from things offered to idols. You see, in Corinthians, Paul writes about that those that meat that was offered to idols was a stumbling block for the weaker brother. Don't stumble them. So that's a whole study for another time. So for the sake of not salvation, but sensitivity, just abstain from it, from, from things that um, offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Because the Gentiles were coming out of paganism that was involved in immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you do well. Now, do you think of baptism or circumcision or keeping the Sabbath was necessary for salvation? They would have put that in here? Of course they would have. So there are those, I'm not saying that baptism isn't important. It's important in obedience to the Lord to be baptized. But we're baptized not in order to be saved. We are baptized because we are saved. And we identify with Christ. Do you understand? And in an act of obedience, we want to go under the water in this newness of life to identify with Christ coming out of the water in this new resurrected life that we live in Christ. So baptism is important, but it's not in order to get saved. Matter of fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians that uh, I baptized a few of you. He names a few people. Uh, he said, I didn't come to baptize, but to give the gospel. Paul would not write that to the Corinthians if baptism was necessary for salvation. So there are those who will come along trying to put this yoke of legalism on us, saying this is what you have to do in order to be saved. And that yoke of legalism is very hard to bear. In Jesus' day, of course, in the Gospels, you see that they really emphasized the Pharisees in keeping the Sabbath day. And they came up with all these rules and regulations and what was to be a day of rest and reflection on the Lord ended up becoming such a heavy burden on the people because of all the rules and regulations. You, you, you can't heal on the Sabbath, they said to Jesus. Your disciples can't, you know, take grain of, of wheat in the corners of the field and rub it because they were hungry because that's threshing, that's work, and that's unlawful. And it was a huge contention that they had the Pharisees with Jesus over the Sabbath. And Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. People who want to put a yoke of legalism on, four things that I want you to remember or just to jot down. That the yoke of legalism, what can happen is they trust in something other than the finished work of Christ on the cross because they believe this is what I have to do to earn salvation, to earn God's approval. They want... To please God, they, they want to be accepted by God, but this is what I have to do to complete my salvation. Will you always remember this? Because this is the gospel, and it is clear in the New Testament that salvation is a gift. It is a gift, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not of ourselves, Ephesians chapter 2. And you can go through the New Testament, Romans, and, and other writings of Paul that declare to us very clearly that salvation is a gift. It is by faith alone and it is by Christ alone. Now, with that said, I don't want to come against anyone who has certain conviction about spiritual matters and different things that they are convicted to do and things that they don't do. Where we put on the yoke of legalism is when we say, I have to do that to, in order to be saved. And there's something that is in us that says there's no free gifts. You know, my dad would tell me, there's no free gifts, son. You got to work for it. And, and that can be brought into our spiritual lives, that we have to somehow earn salvation. We've got to gain the approval of God. And the focus then becomes, as we put on a yoke of legalism, that this is what I have to do, rather than the gospel grace that says, it is done. He did it all on the cross. 
He rose from the grave. And now we come in faith. And as we do, justification comes to us or salvation. There's a difference between putting on the yoke of legalism that says, I have to do this in order to be saved. I've had many people, even recently, that have come to me and I say, I really struggle. I think it's, you know, by performance. And they base their Christian walk on performance rather than faith. I want to walk in obedience. And I think a lot of you would say the same thing. But I walk in obedience because I have the Spirit of God in me. And it's the goodness of God that leads men in repentance. And I walk in the Spirit. And I'm free to live for Him. Because I'm a new creation in Christ. But if I just base my Christianity on performance and the yoke of legalism, and this is what I have to do, then you're going to be up and down spiritually all the time. And you're embracing a false gospel. Yoke yourself to Christ who said, come to me all of you who are weary and heavy laden and come learn of me and you'll find rest for your souls. It goes on to say that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So the yoke of legalism, when we, we say this is what I have to do to perform to be saved, rather than by faith alone, the finished work of the cross. Second of all, those who put on a yoke of legalism, that sometimes, I'm not saying it's for all, but they can desire to be controlling over others. I think about Rehoboam in, in 1 Kings um, chapter 12. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. The people come to him and say, Rehoboam, listen, your father put a heavy burden on us in taxes and all of this. And Rehoboam comes back to the people and he says, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to even be worse. I'm going to really, you know, tax you guys and, and like my, my fist is going to be on you guys, ruling over them. And the people rebelled and the nation split in two. I have seen legalism and heavy yokes that people have tried to put on others to try to control them. And it has caused confusion and has caused division and rebellion in the church. There's one in 3 John, that little epistle in the back of your Bible, that John mentions Diotrephus. Diotrephus, he loves to have preeminence over people. He's kicking people out of the church. I think about the most eminent apostles in the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians that Paul's writing about them, he says they're putting this heavy yoke on you of even punching you guys in the face, wanting to rule over you. And Paul writes to them, I'm not here to rule over you, but to be helpers of your joy. We didn't come peddling the word of God, but we came to give you the gospel freely to you. We know that Jesus, writing to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, he commends them. He says, I know your works and that you know those who are true and you point out those who are false. He goes on to say that, uh, that you also hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nico, where you get the word Nike. You know, buy a pair of Nike shoes, you can rule over people, you can jump higher, you can run faster. Nico, laetin, laity, to rule over the people. Jesus says, I hate that doctrine. I'm here to be a helper of your joy. Not to try to control you. I will give you the truth of God's word. I will always remind you that we're to walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. That walking in obedience is very, very important, but I'm not going to rule over you. And I remember when I was young in my ministry that there would be a few pastors that said, you've got to lay down the law. You've got to emphasize the law in your church or you're going to have a bunch of carnal people. You don't want to talk too much about grace and about the love of God. I know that as I think about what he did for me, that I say what Paul says, it's the love of Christ that compels me, that motivates me. And Paul would say to the Roman Christians that you can sum up the whole law in one word, that is love. Walk in his love. Enjoy him. Know him. Go to him. Have a desire to, to Lord, just grow me as I walk in the Spirit. And learning of his grace and provision for you that you can't help but marvel. 
Thirdly, those who put on the yoke of legalism, sometimes they do that because they want people to think that I'm so spiritual. So they can be highly esteemed by others. And of course, the ultimate example of that is the mentality of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They walked around with their robes and rules and praying and you know, fasting and noses in the air. And inwardly, Jesus said, you're full of hypocrisy and carnality. Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart. And then fourthly, I think that people put heavy yokes of legalism on others because they want them to be spiritually somber like them. Uh, I go through so much for Jesus. I'm bearing this yoke and, and look at what I do and look what I don't do. And you need to be like me. You needed to do the same thing. And you probably have talked with somebody who, you know, they they just are really heavy. And you need to do this. And you need to do this act. And they're just kind of sour and dour. And they have a lack of joy. And they bring this heaviness. And you walk away going, yuck, what was that all about? Because they're trying to put this yoke of rules and regulations on you. The disciples in the book of Acts, as you read in chapter 15, I believe, it mentions that they brought great joy to the cities as they were going through on their missionary journeys. Acts chapter 8 says the same thing. When the disciples went and were, the word of God was spreading and the gospel was spreading, it says that they brought joy wherever they went. That's my prayer for you. That as you leave this place, that you would bring joy wherever you go. To the people around you, linked to you that are around you in your life, that you would bring joy by bringing a message of hope and of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. doesn't mean you compromise in any way. To be honest with them. To say, listen, God cares about you. He doesn't want you to continue in sin. The world's not your hope. Turn to him. Repent. We can be honest in that way, but to bring joy, because people are looking for hope. They're losing hope. And we have that message of hope. But if you bring a a yoke of legalism to them, this is what you have to do. And in all of this, you will bring joy whenever you go. Big difference. Sometimes we have to be honest with people and give them some hard words. But we do it out of love and speak the truth in love. And people know the difference. They know when you really care about them. When you say, brother, don't go down that road. Don't continue in that sin because it's going to destroy you. And God loves you and he wants to bring forgiveness. But if you bring a yoke of legalism, you can bring this heaviness to people. So Peter says, why do we want to do this? This yoke of legalism on these new Gentile converts that we, they couldn't, you know, that we couldn't bear. So Paul and Barnabas, along with the, you know, Titus, they go summons to Jerusalem. Now, Barnabas, his name means, as many of you know, son of consolation or son of comfort. And that was the ministry of Barnabas. He's the one that came to the apostles in Jerusalem, and he's the one that would say, listen, you need to receive Paul. His conversion is real because, again, they were saying, we're not sure if Paul was really converted. Uh, We're not so sure about him. And, And Barnabas said, receive him. We know that when he left and went to Tarsus for seven years, revival breaks out in Antioch, Assyria. It was Barnabas that went to Tarsus to find Paul to bring him back to Antioch so they could teach the disciples there. And that took a lot of effort for Barnabas to do. There was no social media. There was no Google Maps. There was no texting Paul. Where are you? He had to go through a lot of effort to find Paul, to find him to bring him back to Antioch, come with us and teach these new disciples. And what I pray is that this church, that there's more Barnabases that are here. That you bring comfort and consolation and encouragement and build others up in the things of the Lord, in the ways of the Lord. And it takes effort and it takes time. And you can think, well, I do that through social media. Listen, That's fine, and that's great. We use social media, and we want to build people up 
in the things of the Lord. But I really believe where you're going to be effective, where I'm going to be effective, is when you personally seek people out that you know are hurting, that need to be encouraged in the things of the Lord, and you are a son, a daughter of consolation, of encouragement to them, to take the time and make the effort to personally talk with them, invite them to coffee, invite them to dessert, have a word of encouragement to them. But that was Barnabas' ministry. And it's interesting that Barnabas, Paul in his first missionary journey, as you read the book of Acts, it was John Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, that went with them. All of a sudden, John Mark leaves that missionary journey when they would go up into the area of Galatia. The Bible doesn't say why John Mark left. He goes back to Jerusalem. Some suspect that the reason that he left Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary journey was John Mark was young. He was immature. He was scared. And so he went back to Jerusalem. Now, if I traveled with Paul the Apostle, I would be scared too. I mean, the the persecution that he went through. It could be that, but here's another thought. It could be that John Mark was bound up in this legalism. That as Paul's given the gospel of grace, that he's saying, I don't know about this. And he leaves and he goes to Jerusalem. Now, Paul goes to Barnabas and he says, let's go back and let's go encourage the Christians of Galatia. Barnabas says, great. I'll go get John Mark. Paul says, no, you won't. Yeah, he needs to go with us, Barnabas says. Paul says, he's not coming with us. Yes, he is. No, he's not. And the contention was so, you know, strong and severe that Barnabas takes John Mark, he goes his way. Paul takes Silas and he goes his way. The point I'm trying to make is this. Was he afraid, John Mark? I don't know. Was he caught up in legalism? I don't know. But at the end of Paul's life, that Paul would write to Timothy and said, bring John Mark to me. Because he's useful to me. Was telling me that Barnabas just worked with him, was patient with him, and helped him to grow in the things of the Lord. You know, one of the things that really is on my heart for particularly our young people is to be patient with them and to grow them, to minister to them in that way, to come alongside of them. I remember going to pastor's conferences when, you know, Pastor Chuck Smith would speak about when the Jesus movement and the revival came out. And, and those guys, you know, that first generation of, of pastors that you hear on Grace FM that God has worked through them in mighty ways and have, you know, just churches of thousands or whatever, they would tell us that we drove Pastor Chuck crazy. That's why he's bald. That's why he lost all his hair. It's because we drove him crazy, but he always loved us. He always loved us. And there may be those who are young in the Lord or a little green or like a little puppy dog bouncing around. You have to kind of take a newspaper and kind of bonk them on the nose or whatever, but don't stop loving them. Be patient with them. I pray for sons and daughters of consolation that are willing to really make the effort to minister to others. Titus went with us, Paul says. Now, Titus is interesting. We know that Titus was um, one that was a young convert of Paul. He would be referred to as a brother to Paul in Christ. In Titus chapter 1, Paul writes that epistle, part of the pastoral epistles. He's a son in the faith. As there was Titus, that he was pastoring the church at Crete. It's interesting that Titus is not mentioned in the book of Acts. Maybe I just find that interesting. We know that he would be the carrier of Second Corinthians. Matter of fact, Paul writes about Titus in Second Corinthians, how he had no peace when Titus was absent. And then later on in the letter, he would speak about how Titus brought comfort to Paul when he came to him. So Titus would carry that letter back to the Corinthians, and that was written in a time frame of Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 20. But Dr. Luke doesn't mention Titus. Why is that? I don't know. Tradition says that Titus 
was the brother of Luke. We don't know for sure, but maybe Luke said, I don't want to mention my brother. But Titus is very important to Paul in the leadership. And as we continue, verse 2, And I went up by revelation and communicate to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So Paul here writes that I went up to Jerusalem by revelation with these guys. And one of the reasons that many believe that this is the Acts chapter 11 visit of Paul and Barnabas is because in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council, they were summoned. Here he says that we went up because of revelation. God told me to go. And it wouldn't be to address the council that he says specifically, but he met with the church leaders of Jerusalem privately. He writes perhaps the apostles themselves. Those of reputation. In other words, if I mentioned names, you would know who I was talking about. So I think the apostle here is being sensitive. I met with them privately and communicated the gospel that I had been preaching to the Gentiles, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So what Paul is not saying is that I met with them to run this gospel by them to see if it was okay or if I was wrong or if I needed to change it. No, he was going to defend the gospel. He knew it was true. And he goes to them because I think that as he goes to them, he's concerned for the leaders at this point that this false gospel was spreading to them. Perhaps that they might come against him and the work that was being done among the Gentile churches and spreading the gospel of peace. He didn't want there to be conflict with the guys in Antioch, um, with you know the leaders of the church of Jerusalem. He knew there needed to be a single message and a coming together in the truth of God's word and the truth of the gospel. And in verse 3, yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because a false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So Paul points out here in verse 3 that Titus, who was a Gentile, was accepted by the leadership in Jerusalem. He was not circumcised, and the leadership did not compel Titus to be circumcised. And that was important because the leaders are now accepting the gospel of grace. Because if they had stood firm on what the Judaizers were saying, you must be circumcised in order to be saved, they would have made a case to Paul and Barnabas, Titus needs to be circumcised. He needs to get cut. Necessary for salvation. Now the question comes up, somebody will ask me at the door, if Titus was not compelled to be circumcised, why did Paul have Timothy be circumcised in the book of Acts chapter 16? The reason that Timothy was circumcised, and there's no conflict, is because Timothy, his mother was Jewish, his father was Gentile, so Timothy was Jewish. Paul says, you've got a calling of God on your life, Timothy, and we want you to travel with us. And when Paul on those missionary journeys would travel into a city, the very first place he would go into is what? The synagogue. And he did it for the sake of not salvation, having Timothy be circumcised, but for the sake of sensitivity. If we go into the synagogue and they know you being Jew are not circumcised, our ministry is over. They're not going to receive from us. So Timothy, out of this the whole issue of sensitivity and love, we're going to have you be circumcised. But when it came to Titus, who was Gentile, if Paul would have given in, which he did not even for an hour, about being circumcised, then there would have been a compromise and there would have been confusion and given in to a false gospel. But Paul's victory here in verse 3, as he met with the leadership, didn't come easy. Because there were still those who would make it an issue that Titus wasn't circumcised for salvation. And so there were the false brethren, he says, he calls them. They're, they're sneaking in among the Christians that would attempt to bring them under the bondage of legalism. They spy out the liberty that the Christians had in Christ. This bondage that they want to put them under, verse 6, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they are, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Paul here, the church leaders in Jerusalem, those who are highly esteemed, those who are of reputation. Here, Paul says, makes no difference to me. Now, he's not saying that to put them down or 
you know, he's not insulting them or copying an attitude against them. He's just expressing, listen, I did not let them intimidate me or sway me or awe me and to compromising the gospel. I think that's an important consideration in the day in which we are living in. There can be those who are very popular. They can be very popular in the political realm. They can be very popular in the church, pastors, evangelists, worship leaders. And if we are not careful, we can be swayed by them. One of the things that the pandemic brought out is all these YouTubes, people listening to YouTube after YouTube and podcasts. And these guys have very strong opinions and people get swayed by them rather than making it a priority to filter everything through the word of God. Because we're to test the spirits to see if they are of God. And as we do, then you're going to get clear direction and understanding but what can happen is those of reputation, those who, who are popular, those of high esteem can begin to sway some of us. And we need to be careful on that because the foot of the cross is flat and God shows personal favoritism to no one. And we happen to live in a day and age where even in the church, you know, we go, to, you know, this guy's real popular. This guy is highly esteemed. We put people on a pedestal. And whenever we put anyone on a pedestal, we're saying that God loves them more than us. Being a Christian and me being the, the, the leader, you know, the pastor of this church, and I'm not saying I'm one of those that's popular and all of, all of that, but what that means is I'm the servant of all. And all of us are to move forward in humility and in gentleness and in meekness, knowing that the Lord shows no personal favoritism. And don't get swayed by somebody who seems to be the popular voice of the day. We can appreciate those that God has blessed their ministry. We can appreciate those who are anointed teachers. Of course we can. But we have the final authority of the word of God. Amen. And be wise. Have a good biblical worldview. Because Christians can be swayed in this thing or that thing. And have strong opinions. I get that. But don't let those who seem to be popular, and there's just something in us that we like to follow those who are popular. You know, churches, they, they get somebody who's well-known. They like to drop names. So-and-so comes to my church. The foot of the cross is flat. And God loves you, and you have the word of God. You have the Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you. Amen? And know this, that you are important to the Lord. That he has a ministry for you that is just as important as my ministry because we all belong to the body of Christ. We're all different members, different giftings, different places, different activities and ministries that he gives to us. And God shows no personal favoritism. Bring joy wherever you go. And point people not to a person, but to the Lord. Amen? Okay, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for this word given to us and we thank you that we can be encouraged in the things of the Lord and I pray that that Lord right now as we conclude this service that we would remember this that the foot of the cross is flat and God shows no personal favoritism to anyone but we all are loved by you have a place in the body of Christ. And I thank you for that. And we have the word of God to, to give us truth and to keep us grounded in the things that are important in our lives, different, different matters, how to live our life, how to remain in that truth and be strong, secure, and wise. Father, I thank you for that. And I do pray that we would be ones that we would bring a gospel of hope and truth and grace to others as we go our way. That there would be more sons and daughters of consolation to encourage others. They're downcast, struggling. 
that just need someone to come along and care for them, talk with them, to make the effort, to spend the time and expand the energy, to be sensitive to your leading in that. Father, I thank you that you sent your son to die on a cross for us to give us hope. And I pray for anyone that is here that you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for you and for your sins because we've all sinned. Don't think that you can earn salvation. Don't think you can be good enough because you never will be. It's by faith in him and what he did on the cross and make an atonement for your sins because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ who cried out from that cross, it is finished. He rose from the grave, he conquered sin and death. And now as we come, repent, turn direction you're going and call out on the name of the Lord and recognize your need to be forgiven and surrender your life to him as Lord and Savior. You can do that right now. Today's the day of salvation. You can pray, Jesus, I come to you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. That you made atonement for my sins, forgive me. And I ask that you would sit upon the throne of my life as my personal Lord and Savior. And I do want to know you and walk with you and please you with my life. I thank you for this new beginning. I thank you for bringing me into the family of God. In Jesus' name. And for all of us as we leave this place, that Lord, that we would be a light in the darkness. Bring wisdom in the confusion. That you make us strong when we are weak. To trust in you in everything. With our family, our children, our grandchildren. Lord, that we would rest in your love. Knowing that you care for us. And that we can cast our cares upon you. Bless everyone here as we go our way. In Jesus' name.